our department and USM for hosting me. Um, and thanks for showing up. Even though I know the big draw was the pizza. Um, so my website's on the bottom. Uh, I will admit I'm horrible about updating it, so it's probably out of date. But um, there is a lot more uh, images and information if you choose to look at that later. Uh, but the work I create, um, I guess I'd be classified as a functional or utilitarian potter. And um, I've currently predominantly finished my work in a wood-fired kiln. And so what I'm making, right, what is, what is a utilitarian pot? Um, it's a form, it's a vehicle in which to provide the body with sustenance, right? Everyone needs to eat. Everyone needs to drink. So this idea um, is, you know, it, it breaks down all social barriers, right? It's, it's uh, everyone, like I said, everyone needs to eat, everyone needs to drink. It's a basic human need. Um, so it, it's, you know, it, it breaks down barriers such as race, religion, age, uh, gender. So these last couple images, what I'm showing you is from my um, thesis exhibition. Uh, I graduated from Syracuse University in 2010 with my MFA. And I really see my work as not being complete until it's actually being used, right? That's its original intent, for someone to actually use it, this experience that I'm creating. And so I struggle with how I was going to be able to um, have that experience for everyone that was coming to my exhibition. And this is what I came up with. I made 600 cups, and I found these two old library tables, and uh, there's only, I think, maybe 100 cups on each table right now. But I invited people, as they entered the exhibition, to pour through these cups, check them out, touch them, um, and then select one to use during the opening reception, um, completing the work. So, as you see, each cup is relatively the same size, glazed um, in the same color. I wanted them to retain the same value, um, but they're all very loosely thrown, so each form is slightly different. Um, so they are individual. I also stamp each cup to kind of commemorate the event, um, and I numbered them in order of production. Um, one to signify that this individual cup was once part of a larger, a larger <coughs> collective of pieces. Um, so this brings about you know interesting ideas of choice and how does one choose, right? It's an internal struggle based on your individual aesthetic values. Um, it also becomes a communal activity, um, you know, talking about the cup. And I invited people if they liked the cup that they chose, they can take it with them as a gift, right? And I'm giving them the permission to choose, so they take ownership. You know, it was interesting to hear conversations that, look at my cup, you know? Um, and because it's a gift, it's a, a very special connection is then formed between me and everyone that came to this exhibition. Um, one thing I should back up, one thing I didn't realize with, um, by stamping and individually numbering each cup, that once you put an identifiable mark on something, um, people immediately have a connection to that. And so there was a, some people searched for a particular number because that number had value to them. And so it wasn't the form of the cup or how the cup felt in their hand, but that that number, you know, was so important to find. Um, yeah, and. And so as this activity is going on, you know, maybe these people knew each other, maybe they didn't, but they all become part of this activity. Um, and so I threw in a couple just production shots because I think people find that always interesting. Um, this is a weekend worth of throwing. Um, I divided this project into, uh, it probably took about a month and a half, I guess, from start to finish, but I divided it into three weekends of making. So I would start out 
um, I hired one of my students to weigh and wedge out balls of clay for me. And I would sit at the wheel and just throw cups nonstop. Um, starting Saturday morning, and usually I could, this is a day of throwing. Um, and then Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, I'd be trimming these cups. Um, and then I'd take a little break, work on my thesis paper, and then start over again. And uh, so this is uh, getting glazing, getting ready to fire. Um, loading up, it, this is just to give you an idea, uh, this is a 50 cubic foot gas kiln, and I had to fire this twice, so it's about 300 cups in each kiln. <coughs> uh, before going to graduate school, I spent a lot of time at this place called Watershed Center for the Ceramic Arts, which probably anyone that's taken Brandon's class um, is a little familiar with this place. Uh, it is this amazing residency program uh, not too far from here in Newcastle, Maine. Um, but I spent about a year and a half there, mixing clay, digging ditches, uh, but also freshly out of undergrad, I was trying to figure out <coughs> what it meant to be a potter, right? What was this material? Trying to understand the technical aspects of it. Um, also trying to understand form, um, surface. So at this time I'm firing um, predominantly in a salt kiln, so an atmospheric kiln, layering glazes. Uh, my studio at the time had this big bay window and it happened to be a particularly snowy winter. And so looking at my environment for inspiration, I'm trying to replicate uh, that illusion of snow, that illusion of depth on the surface. And, um, Fortunately, at Watershed, I had my first experience firing a wood kiln, um, which I was immediately drawn to for a number of reasons. One, just I'm a very physical person, and you know, the wood firing process is very physical. You're there, you're, you're splitting wood, you're, you're throwing it into this hot kiln with fire um, just coming out of the door at you. It's very exciting, it's very intense, uh, but also I grew up I grew up in Maine. I grew up in a really old farmhouse with a stone foundation. Um, and it was heated exclusively with a wood stove, um, including our hot water. And so this, this process of, of chopping wood and getting up early to, to light the fire was really ingrained in me from a young age. Um, so this process just was really felt natural to me. Um, and I really liked the results that came out of the kiln. And so this is actually a platter from that first firing. Um, and it really, it, it records the process. Um, and, you know, depending on how you stack the work in the kiln, um, depicts, uh, um, what do I want to say? The surface is, is um, changed by how you load, the length of the firing, the type of wood. So there's a lot of variables there. But I really, I really view this right. It's a, it's, it's a timeless surface, um, you know. And when I say timeless, I'm, it's not connected to any specific time period or any culture, right, in existence. Um, and it, it, it is a recordance of process. And so again, looking to my environment for inspiration. Um, on your right is a uh, image, a detail image of this tractor that's not far from my house where I grew up, that's uh, stuck in a field. And it's just this beautiful thing that this farmer was plowing the field and got stuck and just left it there. And it's just slowly rotting away over time. I mean, who knows how long this thing's been there. Um, and then on the left is an image of my work, a detailed image of my work. So you can kind of see the similarity there. So there's decay, but there's also growth. Right? Anyone that's been to the coast of Maine knows this lichen that grows all over the granite rocks. And it's just beautiful, these bright colors. Um, and again, on your right is a, a cup of mine. So after Watershed, um, I'm like really excited about ceramics. I'm really excited about wood firing. I get accepted to graduate school. And I'm like, all right, it's wood firing all the way. 
but I really have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and so this is the kiln that was at Syracuse. It's a 120 cubic foot onagama. Um, if you, it's a little dark, but there's a person standing right in front of that kiln, so you could actually walk into the kiln standing up. So it's rather large. And so to try to figure this kiln out and to try to figure out just wood firing in general, um, I sort of set myself up with this project that I was going to map the interior of the kiln. And so what I did is I made 300 salad plates. I seem to like to punish myself by making a lot of things. Um, so there's only actually 200 up here. Um, I underestimated how much room that was going to be when I hung it on the wall. Uh, but what I did was I, I made all these plates the same size, dipped them in the same slip, and I stacked them in stacks of five, sort of, they sort of look like little tower, towering pagodas. And I filled the kiln, and I fired it, and then as I unloaded, I carefully recorded where every plate was um, within the kiln. So as you're looking at this, um, the left is the front, the right is the back, and then top and bottom accordingly. And so that other 100 plates should actually be below this. Uh, but you can see the color variation. Um, and this is all just from heat, um, the difference in heat from front to back. Um, so when I sh this was part of a larger class um, in this gallery space. So I also had this table you know, with salad and speaking to the, these are functional objects. This is not just a conceptual piece um, you know, on the wall. It is, but it also has another um, component to it. So this is just a detail image. This is one from the back, um, you know, much lighter in color, much drier in surface. This is a detail one from the front, right? It got much harder. The surface is a lot richer, darker. Um, the pattern left from the flame is much more intense. Uh, I've actually I've reinstalled this piece a number of times, um, and this time just sort of playing with color here. But all this information um, allowed me to understand this kiln, but allowed me to create this piece too, which was the second component of my thesis exhibition. Um, this is a set of dinner plates, um, obviously depicting the lunar cycle. And what I was thinking was this um, is, is a couple things. One, that sort of <coughs> cosmic mystical surface that the wood firing creates, right? These sort of shooting comets. Um, but also sort of this circular way that you work as a potter and not just literally making round things on the wheel, but this cycle of making, you know, I'm, I'm making clay, I'm making work, I'm firing a kiln, unloading, getting results, and then responding to that to go back to another round of making. Um, and also, you know, this, this, at a dinner table, you sit around this communal aspect of that. Um, so there's a couple images of that. Um, and part of my research in graduate school, I got, that kiln was so large that I got a little frustrated with the turnaround time. Um, if I was really pushing myself, I was firing that three times a year, or three times an academic year, which was pretty intense. Um, so I convinced my professors to give me some money, I found a grant from the school, I got some donations, and I designed and built this small train style wood kiln, um, which again, I knew nothing about kiln building, and I made a lot of mistakes, and I stacked a lot of bricks, unstacked them, and restacked them again. but. From failure, you learn a lot. And um, just a couple, a couple shots in here. And anyone that was in Michael's class last night, I talked a little bit about this. Uh, some structural things. Um, I, I really wanted an arched roof um, just for the way that the distribution of heat. But I also wanted a roof that 
the lid that lifted off um, for easy access for loading. And so I designed these really complicated forms, um, these end caps that I could have an arched roof. And so then this is an image of the cast. Uh, this is all high temperature refractory that I cast this lid with. It weighs about a thousand pounds. Um, and then this is some this is some work from that particular kiln that I made in graduate school. And so I should take, this is a good image, I'll take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the uh, wood firing process. Um, so this, we have this material, clay, that we can dig from the ground, right? It's this soft, malleable material we can form and shape into basically anything you could dream up you could make out of clay. It's a really versatile material. And then we apply heat to that material, which changes it chemically into a different material we call ceramics. And so depending on what you use as a heat source has an effect on the work. Right? So if you fire in an electric kiln, you're using radiant heat, like an oven, um, to heat up the work. Or if you use gas, the fossil fuel, um, to heat up the work. Or say, in my case, wood, right, to use as a heat source. Well, wood is a solid fuel. Um, all fuel needs oxygen in order to combust. Right? So in an enclosed environment, that fuel source is using up all the oxygen in the kiln, only leaving carbon, right? And that carbon is then reacting with the surface, with the glazes, to create different colors. Um, and there's also a lot of byproduct of burning a solid fuel source. So with wood, there's a lot of residual trace elements, a lot of salts um, that are released. And you think about this when you have a campfire, right? You have all those little sparks that fly up in the air. Um, in ceramics, we call that fly ash. And that ash um, flies through the kiln, and it sticks to the pots, it sticks to the walls, it sticks to the shelves. It's actually the same thing that builds up in your chimney as creosote. But because we're going to such high temperatures, that actually melts into a natural glaze. So you can see on the front of this picture, those like dark brown drips is actually ash. Um, so it creates a natural glaze. And so in order to keep these pieces from sticking to the shelf, um, we use this material called wadding. It's a refractory substance that you roll up into little gumball size shapes and you stick to the pot. So those three little dots on this picture is actually three little um, gumballs of wadding and that picture was fired on its side. And what that does is it allows that it ensures that this picture won't be stuck to the shelf, right? I'm not trying to create sculpture. I'm trying to create useful objects. And so, inevitably, the wadding makes a mark. So I try to use that mark to my advantage. As opposed to there being three dots on the bottom, I'm using it as a, a decorating technique on the side. And so, be, that the innovation I talked about, about that lid, um, I actually got contacted by this small publication out of Ireland to write an article about that. And I, I put this in here because this is something I never thought I would do as an artist would be writing and publishing in magazines. Um, but it's something that just sort of presented itself. I took advantage of it and um, it's really opened a lot of doors for me. Um, so that English class is very important. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, moving ahead a little bit, after graduate school, I got a really amazing fellowship at uh, Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. Uh, I was a resident artist for a year, that, and uh, they provided me housing and studio space and a stipend, and my only requirement was to be in my studio and make work. Um, so I don't know, uh, you remember that earlier butter dish? So this is about five years, five years later, right? I'm still revisiting this same form, uh, a little more mature. Um, so during my exit interview in graduate school, one of my um, 
advisors, you know, she asked me, you know, what what are you what are you doing in wood firing that's different? Um, you know, how are you contributing um, to this aesthetic? And so, you know, I thought long and hard about that, and and I didn't know. You know, wood firing, the first piece of ceramics ever created was fired with wood, right? So basically, the entire history of ceramics is the history of wood firing. And so I started to do a lot of research to try to understand, well, what could I do that hasn't, that hasn't been done before? And so thinking about wood firing in the past, right, before the discovery of fossil fuels, um, all ceramics in history were fired with wood, including those beautiful porcelain um, Ming Dynasty blue and white bases, right, which are extremely pristine. Well, how do they how did they get that without that getting covered with that ash? Well, they used this is a picture actually from a pottery in England, um, but they're stacking up saggers. So inside each sagger, which is basically a cylinder of clay, is a pot, and this sagger protects them from the atmosphere of the kiln. All that byproduct of that fuel um, hits the outside of the sagger as opposed to the glaze piece on the inside. So I started thinking about this and started thinking about, well, you know, this is, this is controlling the environment in the kiln, and how could I control the environment um, in a different way? So I came up with this idea that I termed as a flame deflector. Um, and so this is a, uh, a cylinder I cut in half, cut some holes in it, and then use it in the kiln to control the f how the flame hit the work. Right? So as opposed to having this really organic, um, sort of loose, abstract mark-making process, now I... Um, there's a lot of intention to how the flame is hitting the surface. Um, it's controllable. I'm getting a much, even though it's slightly blurred, I am getting uh, a sort of a recognizable mark, right? There's a bunch of dots. Um, so this is an image of actually loading in the kiln to give you an idea of how that works. But then I was a little frustrated, like, well, what are these flame deflectors? Um, they ended up, because you know clay shrinks, I couldn't reuse them, so they became a one-time use thing, and they were just ending up in the dumpster. And I didn't really know how I felt about that. And so I tried to think about, well, how could the deflector actually be an object in itself? And so this is a, a sort of solution to that, you know, thinking that this deflector could then be a colander or a fruit bowl. Um, and this is the bowl that was inside of that. I like this, you know, it was fairly predictable results, um, but I could only transfer very basic shapes, you know, squares, lines, circles, and, you know, what, what was I really saying with that, uh, besides creating pattern on the surface? And it was only one, excuse me, one-sided. Um, so the back side of this is much more, um, or much less interesting. Um, so I sort of, this, this idea sort of ran, ran its course, uh, and I sort of lost interest a little bit. May revisit it someday, not sure. Uh, but I moved on to a different um, sort of mark-making technique that I could control. And with this, I'm still using this idea of the sagger, um, but, what I'm doing now is these little these little cups here on the bottom um, are actually filled with combustibles, and the cup then becomes the cap to the sagger. So sort of similar to what we're going to be doing with a paper kiln, where we're going to be using combustibles um, to fume the surface to create interesting marks. Here I'm I'm controlling uh, the area in which that um, combustible touches, so it becomes a very localized. Um, mark making, but it still retains that organic quality of the wood fire kiln. Um, and so depending on what you put in that sagger um, will create different effects of that mark. Um, so these were just um, charcoal 
This one had some uh, walnut husks in it, and so there's that dark ring surrounded by that tannish ring, which comes from the walnut husk, um, similar to like walnut oil to stain wood. Uh, recently, I got this amazing opportunity to go to China uh, through West Virginia University. And um, saw just mind blowing, you know, ancient historical sites. The Terracotta Army. Um, they have such a rich, rich history in ceramics, um, you know, thousands of years older than what we have here. Of course, our country is, you know, relatively young. Um, This is uh, where the Dalai Lama stays when he is in Beijing. This is his house. It's still an active Buddhist temple. But I got the opportunity to go into um, all of these ceramic factories. Um, I stayed uh, for a month in the town of Jingzhen. It's a town of a million people, and the entire town revolves around the production of ceramics. Um, there's a, a local artisans that specialize in various techniques. So this is a big vase factory. Um, and you can see the very poor working conditions um, that these, you know, dirt floor, no lights, there's tarps hanging from the ceiling to, to funnel the, the rainwater that drips through the roof um, to the outside. But they're still able to create these very pristine objects. Uh, but I was, I really, uh, like walking through the sea of vases, I was just really taken aback by the scale um, of this work. And so this has led to, I've taken a shift in my work, and this is the current work I'm working on now, these vases that are about, um, they're about three feet tall. You can see on the, on the bottom left, there's a mug flipped upside down to give you a little bit of idea of scale. Um, so unfortunately, none of these have been finished yet, um, so these are just in the greenware state. Um, but this is sort of the, the current body of work that I'm working on now. Very different. Um, one, the large scale, but I'm also really, uh, I'm just carving the surface very intensely, um, which is something that I've never done before. And it just feels right, so I'm going with it. Um, and that's it kind of talked a little fast, but uh, 